We have an extra special day today, um, two panel discussions uh, with mothers and families uh, of people who were killed by the police, the celebrants who we are honoring as part of this exhibition. Uh, each panel discussion, so the first one is starting right now, it's going to be 60 minutes of conversation between the families. And then I'm going to hand out pieces of paper. If you have any questions, we'll do Q&A at the end for 15 minutes. You write your questions on a piece of paper. We'll collect them and ask them at the end. My name is Claudio von Adraber. Um, I am a part of the Wordless team, a curator here. And I'll hand over to Mohamed Gurdjistani, who is the artist behind 1-800-HAPPY-BIRTHDAY, who will introduce Reverend Wanda Johnson. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I hope you also have some time today before you leave to check out some of the exhibition and the film booths and the family room and, and the bodega and the flower shop and everything else we've put together for you. Um, this is a very special panel that you're about to experience among some very amazing people. Um, you know, I think the themes of this project have existed as long as America has existed. Um, but uh, for my generation, it was uh, Bart Police murdering Oscar Grant that mobilized um, our generation to begin to, you know, take action and organize. Um, and since that day, uh, I think we've become more aware, but there's still so much more work to do. So. Um, Reverend Wanda Johnson has been a leader um, for many of the mothers, for many of the people who work in this space. Um, she's a leader of her community. Um, and honestly, seeing her work, she's a leader in communities nationwide. And um, it's a big honor for me to have everyone here. And I just want to um, say thank you to all the families for being here and just pass it off to Reverend Wanda Johnson. Um, first, I want to say thank you all for being here today. Um, I thank Mohammed and Catherine for uh, bringing uh, Mohammed's vision and their vision into fruition. Um, I am here to moderate uh, the panel today, and I'll introduce each panelist. Um, I'll be asking questions, and we'll have a conversation. Um, I think it's very important that we continue to educate each other on our society, what's going on in our society, and to talk about um, racism and systemic racism, and to talk about policing and what we can do to improve our policing. And I also want you to look back and think back if you've studied history, and if you go back even into the 1800s of policing, I want you to think about the police policing then, and then think about the policing now, and think if we have, how far we have come on this journey of policing. And if we're at the same place in the 1800s, what can we do today to change that so that we can move forward? And so I want to take the time to introduce the panelists. Um, Right here is Gwen Woods. She is the mother of Maria Woods, who was killed in San Francisco. Um, next to her is Gwen Carr. She is the mother of Eric Gartner, who was killed in here in New York. Um, he couldn't breathe. He told the police. Um, we have who, Barbara Doss. Um, we also have Shaquette Clark. We have Latanya Benton. And we have Ashley, Michelle, and Nora Matarosa. Um, one of um, the Matarosas will be uh, interpreting for their mother as well when we ask questions. And please, if you have any questions today, um, they'll give you paper and you can ask those questions as we start the discussion. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to let the panelists uh, 
introduce themselves, introduce their child to you, and I'm asking them to take two to three minutes to do that um, because we have several questions that we are going to be going over into this discussion. Um, I also want to make sure that if there's any uh, people here who help to um, change the laws of this land, there's several laws that this panel of people have worked to get changed or get implemented into our society. Um, the chokehold law um, has been implemented. We also have the Stefan Clark law that has been implemented. We also have another law that's been working on, AB 392. And we also have, um, in California, AB 1506. And we'll talk about those laws as well because they're important for us to really know the laws and begin to work to change the laws that our society currently has in place. So Gwen, if you would lead us off by introducing yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Gwendolyn Woods, um, Mario Woods' mom, San Francisco. Um, I now say they're a terrorist group disguised as a police department, Tick 21 from the back. Um, obviously, um, was no threat. It is video recorded. Um, and so, Mario Woods of San Francisco. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Gwen Carr. I'm the mother of Eric Gardner. Uh, you all heard the story. My son was choked to death. He said he could not breathe, but the disconcerned police officers, they still decided to take his life. And I've been fighting ever since to try to get those police officers fired. They didn't bring any charges against them. So far, I've gotten only one police officer fired, but I'm fighting to get the other five uh, fired, although they are telling me they're not going to do it. But they told me they wasn't going to fire the other police officer either, and I did get him fired. So I'm in this race for the long run. And um, I fought until I got the uh, Eric Garner anti choco bill Pass. And what that does is if any police officers restrict the breathing or chest compression, that they could be brought up on charges and they could uh, spend jail time. So, so far, um, I'm still fighting for different things. I'm fighting for the special prosecutor. We did get that. It was, a, it was an executive order and now it's a law. So... I'm doing things in front of the camera and behind the camera. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Barbara Doss, and I am the mother of Dewan Armstrong, who was murdered in Santa Rita Jail, which uh, my son had never been in trouble before. And even if he was, he was still a human being. He didn't deserve to get what he got. None of them did. Um, my son was incarcerated for something he did when he was 13 years old, which was receiving stolen merchandise. And I recall the day in the morning, and I told him to get it out because I didn't buy it. And that's how my grandmother raised that. If we didn't buy it, you don't bring it in the house. And he got it out, threw it away, or whatever. These were fingerprints that were found. Well, these officers decided to take my son and put him in a full body wrap. <laughs> and tie him up, you know. Mm, took his life from him. And I'm here every day. I'm standing in their face. I'm running up on the general attorney, and it's not going to stop. I'm going to keep doing it. You know, they, they took my son's life, and I know he told them not to do this. My, you're going to have to deal with my mama. Somewhere along the line, he had a chance to say something. At least that's what I want to believe anyway. And I'm going to keep believing it. I'm going to keep fighting for my child and other families because that's what we need, that's what they want us to do, and that's what I'm here to do. His name was Dewan Armstrong. Hello, um, I'm Sequette Clark, affectionately known as Mama Clark. I am the mother of Stefan Clark, 
Stefan was murdered in my mother's backyard March 2018 while only holding a cell phone. Since then, my family has mobilized to get laws, policies, and legislation passed. The Stefan Clark Law is Assembly Bill 392. It holds police accountable for use of excessive force when, when unnecessary. Underneath the Stefan Clark Law, there is one officer serving prison time right now and two officers on trial um, in other cases. Thank you, in California, mm -hmm. as well as the foot pursuit policy in Cal Sacramento, California, has been changed as a result of Stefan Clark. Also, um, the ability for the officers to turn off their cameras has been changed um, because of Stefan Clark. So the officers are now, they have to announce why they are turning off their cameras or their microphones before turning them off, and that's due to Stefan Clark. So I'm a firm believer in change um, for the better, and my son's death will not be in vain. I am here to make sure that his name lives on for generations and generations and generations long after you and I have left this earth, and I'm here to support the other members. I am the mother of Xavier Hill, Xavier Hill was my 18-year-old son, my only child actually, who was killed by Virginia State Police January 2021. So the fight for us is still super, super, super new. Um, we're still, I, I look at these moms here and their fight is they're continuing to fight for their son, so I know the pathway to take to continue to fight for my son. Um, I'm honored to be here. I don't want to be here, but I know I'm here for a reason, and I'm just here to keep fighting for Xavier and for everybody else. Um, hi everyone, my name is Michonne Monterosa. I am the surviving sister of my brother Sean Monterosa who was murdered on June 2nd while being out protesting for George Floyd. We are from San Francisco, but my bro brother had to be murdered in Vallejo, California. As I sit here and, and listen, I wanna pay homage because in the Bay Area, if it wasn't for Oscar Grant and Mario Woods and Alex Nieto, I wouldn't be the activist or the fighter I am. And when that fight becomes personal, like Sean says, it's 10 toes down and you gotta go at it any way you can. One thing about the Vallejo Police Department is that they've had a murderous killing spree from 2012 to 2020. We shouldn't thank Fish for Swimming, but it's been two years since they haven't killed somebody in their demonic ritual. When they kill an innocent black or brown man, they bend the star of their badges to signify how many bodies they've, they've shot at. They celebrate in barbecues and celebration as a code of honor. But from Sean, again, being from San Francisco, we were able to mobilize and bring the whole city of San Francisco to Vallejo and help all the other families of Mario Romero, Angel Ramos, Willie McCoy, <coughs> and now we are a part of the Vallejo community. Although, like I said, we're from San Francisco, but now Vallejo, California has become an extended family. Not even extended, we're family to Vallejo now. Um, through our fight, Ashley and I were the ones who sprung into action so our mother um, can process the morning of coming to America to live the American dream only to be met with the American nightmare. Mm. And since our fight, <laughs> We've been able to support and coalition the Kenneth Ross Jr. De Police Decertification Act in California because we were one of three states who did not have a decertification process for police officers. Um, to this day right now, that bill is being watered down by opposition um, police unions. Um, and that's one thing I wanna highlight too, as we talk about these police departments, we have to talk about how powerful the police unions are and how much billions of dollars they have and are pouring in to obstruct justice for all of us. But something Mama Wanda told, told us today is I recognize that this is God's mission for us and, and we are gonna be the light. We, they might not like us to see us in places, but we're all stronger together and pulling up to the Capitol. Mi nombre es Nora Laura Monterrosa, soy mamá de Sham, y el día 2 de junio del 2020 cambió nuestras vidas. Pero una cosa he demandado y esta seguiré, que he prometido a Dios y a mi hijo, estar enfilada en los escuadrones para traer la justicia. No es fácil este trabajo, 
pero sabemos que todos juntos podemos hacer la diferencia. En Vallejo, el señor Jerry Tong, que asesinó a mi hijo, es, salió del, eh, lo, está off del trabajo, pero está apelando para incorporarse nuevamente. Y como comun, comunidad, como ciudadanos, no podemos permitir que personas que hayan asesinado a otros y como Jerry Tong hirió diferentes miembros de otras personas que quedaron sin sus miembros en su cuerpo, los podamos tener en una comunidad porque esa clase de personas no pueden cuidar de los ciudadanos. Mi hijo era un, un jovencito que luchaba por diferentes etnias para que haya justicia. Estaba estudiando en el college sobre justicia social y era muy trabajador, era poeta, artista. ¿no? Muchos quizás de los que están aquí han visto los, los trabajos de él, de arte. Yo creo que nosotros es doloroso, pero cambiamos el dolor por el poder y el trabajo en acción. Así que estoy un día feliz realmente. Gracias a cada uno de ustedes que están aquí, porque sabemos que podemos todos juntos no son las políticas, sino la dureza del corazón, del alma, del ser humano. Y eso puede cambiar. La luz tiene que esparcir las tinieblas y tenemos que establecer justicia para cada uno de nosotros, de nuestros familiares y de todos los niños que vienen creciendo. Gracias por permitirme este momento. I'm Ashley Monterrosa, also the surviving sister of my brother, Sean Monterrosa, but I want to translate for my mom here. She said that on June 2nd of 2020, um, our brother was on his knees with his hands up when Officer Jarrett Ton pulled up to the parking lot and shot him. Um, she also said that, you know, this isn't the journey that we've chose, but this is the assignment that God gave to us. And she's going to do her best to bring justice, not just for our family, but for everyone. And that Sean was a poet. He was an artist. You might have seen his artwork around there. His nickname was Toucan, because uh, he was a graph writer. Um, <laughs> she gave a lot in that. She said we can't have people in our community like Jarrett Ton policing, because we can't have people that are continuously causing so much harm continuing to be on the streets. We can't have people like Jarrett Ton, quote unquote, protecting us. We need to get rid of So we have had the introduction. Uh, I want to just introduce myself again, too. My name is Wanda Johnson. I am the mother of Oscar Grant, who was killed January 1st, 2009, at the Fruitvale BART station in Oakland, California. Um, you may have heard of the movie Fruitvale Station. It depicted the last 24 hours of my son's life. Um, I want to say that each one of us who has lost a loved one have been seeking justice. And many times when a police officer kills a civilian, they're not held accountable for their actions. Um, oftentimes, if we were to kill someone, we would be held accountable for our actions. Many of us would be put in jail immediately. And if you study the Malcolm X grassroots, you will understand that it said that uh, a African-American or brown person is killed uh, every 28 hours. And even that hours have changed to lessen. Um, they're killed by police or vigilantes. And so what that says to us in this room today that we have a work to do. And so, I'm going to continue to ask the families questions. And I also, again, want you to be thinking about our policing system. Um, and I want to say to you that um, in my case, uh, the officer was charged with involuntary manslaughter, and he was only given 11 months in the county jail. Mm. Many of the families up here, the officers was never charged. And so I, I want to give them space to speak about that as well. So 
Uh, my question to um, you today is, where are you and your family in the process of seeking justice? Uh, if anyone wants to answer, I can, I'll just go right down the line. Gwen, where are you with seeking justice for Mario? Um, I think in San Francisco, the officers are back on duty. Actually, they, um, I don't believe they ever were off. They, I think they were um, kind of admitted to desk work. Charles August, um, and, and I'm on the other end of the spectrum of this because I've seen the system, and it's a system that do, it doesn't work for us. Um, us is, I mean, with a darker hue. It's not fair, and it seems, <sighs> did I have to make my mind up to say, do I have to accept this? Um, because I've seen not only my family, other families that don't get this justice. When I see a city like San Francisco and I was born and raised in it, and it, it, it actually appeals to folks to come and visit it um, as a progressive city. It's only progressive to black, um, to white European looking folk. Um, and unfortunately, to black, brown, and poor folks, it's not fair. Um, sometimes I have to say, I have to do my own pushback on it. But do I believe there's gonna ever be justice with these officers? No. I've seen too many times why would I be the exception to the rule as a black mother, um, that my child was not perfect. I said earlier, I kind of drawn that I'm the, didn't feel inclusive because it feels like us as black folk have to always run out and say, oh, they were, perfect, but everybody should be redeemable. And when you're not a threat and you get 21 bullets to the back and a big bullet hole in your head, and, and my concern is you can ask, well, do the right things. No, white boys don't do the right thing. We're going to talk about Dylan Brooke. And that young man rapes a young lady in broad daylight in Stanford, and the judge says, I'm going to give you six months because I don't want to ruin your life and he barely does three. Then you take, um, that was Brock Turner. Dylan Roof ran into the Bible study, would have took out more than nine bodies if he had a choice. But he gets a courtesy of a bulletproof vest and a Burger King burger, and he is escorted. I mean, thrown, like most of black, brown, and poor folks are. He's escorted. Then you take that young man in Kenesha who walks down broad daylight going into that march, and he is loaded with assault weapons. And police are riding by him, by him and they see this. They know what he's going to do. They're, he's going to do the job that they want to do. And he takes out two people. And a judge ends up singing to him in a court of law. So unless we talk about the two types of policing, and unless we're willing to look at the two types of polling that is not made for all of us, we can't make a change. We can't. So Gwen Carr, what do you think we could do to bring more equality or equal justice to the communities of black and brown? Well, I think um, the first thing we have to do, we have to unite because long as we stay divided, it's not going to happen. We can't pull against each other. We have to say, well, hey, we're going to be in this fight together. And with the communities, we need more police community communication because we do not have enough of that. Police who police our neighborhoods, they know nothing about the people who they are policing. They come from other neighborhoods. They come from the suburbs. And all they, they think that everyone of color is a threat. If you are a, of color, if you wear dreads, it's a deal breaker. Because, oh, he, he, you're automatically guilty. You are a thug. They don't take time to find out what your background is, what your reputation is. You are just automatically profiled and labeled. 
So this has to stop. Police officers don't even get out their cars to come and talk with the young men and women or their families. Years ago, this used to happen. Even though I grew up in Brooklyn, I grew up in downtown Brooklyn, and it was a, even when I think about it, when I think about my age and when I grew up, if you went to public school, everyone who lived in that neighborhood, I don't care what you was, Italian, um, whether you was Jewish, Puerto Rican, black, we all went to the same school. And people think because of my age that I went to segregated school. No, I didn't go to a segregated school. I never went to a segregated school. Because in my area, it was just like that. You went wherever you lived and the school was in that district, everybody went there unless you went to private school. So I never really knew real racism until I got older because we all did things together. All races did things together. I heard my mother and father talk about the racism in the South because that's where they came from, but it didn't become a reality to me until I had children and they start growing up and I start seeing how cruel the police wasn't like they were when I was a kid because the police would bring you home. They could find the boys doing something wrong. They would bring you to your parents. And these were mostly Irish men who were police officers at the time. Even around the school, if they had a police officer walking around the school, and we see them, if somebody is playing hooky or cutting class, they would just run back to their class. Oh, police officer. And now we had a police officer. He was Irish, but his name was Blackie. So he, and we used to say, Blackie is outside. We got to get into class, you know. And it was such a different thing. And now it's like every day there is kids, black kids, girls and boys getting assaulted or killed by the police officer. In my days, I really didn't hear that. To tell, I mean, to be truthful, I didn't hear of young people dying like I do today. So I think we have to bridge the gap. We have to do something about this, even if we have to build up a new police um, administration, because it's deep-seated hate in the police department today. It's just that we are, we have targets on our back, and that shouldn't be. We should be treated as people, we should be treated one-on-one. -on -one. Now, if you do something wrong, if you do a crime, yes, you are supposed to be punished for that crime. But you don't be, the, the police shouldn't be judge, jury, and executioner. Right. They are paid to arrest you and then let due process take place. But that is just not happening today too many times. So let's bridge the, gra the gap. So quit. I want to pass by you for one second, and then I'm going to come back to you. So, Sequet, when we think about the policing, and we also think about media, what has been your take or your discovery when you have dealt with media and concerning the media after the loss of your child? So... Um Number one, um, before I answer that, I just want to piggyback really quick about bridging the gap. Bridging the gap is the key, I think, to the first question. To answer your question about the media and how I have to deal with the loss of my son. So what happens is our child, my child was executed. He was executed. Um, he was asked to put his hands up. And when he did, they shot him 20 times. Um, after that, the district attorney held a press conference to um, revive my son, to bring him back to life, just to reassassinate him, to demean him, to belittle him, to criminalize him, to dehumanize him, to assassinate everything that I know that I intentionally taught him. They, they turned him into a criminal. They turned him into someone in the media's eyes, anyone watching would consider 
he deserved what happened to him. And that's the case. When you have a high-profile um, case like this, when the police are obviously wrong, they not only didn't announce themselves, mm -hmm. they were chasing my son after another uh, citizen was chasing. My son was running from a citizen. The police picked up and, and, and took over the chase. So my son, with his headphones on, didn't know who was chasing him. He just was being chased. When he realized that it was the police, he, he cooperated, right? Um, after they shot him, they turned off their, their body cameras and they turned off their microphones to discuss the wrongdoings. They blocked off the streets from three different directions to my mother's house. And no, my, my parents were held falsely imprisoned for three days, no one in, no one out, while they did their cover up. So the media and the district attorneys and the police officers, they come together to form a story to present to the world to cover up their wrongdoings. And so it's very important to find a way to police the police. It's very important to find a way to um, be transparent because accountability without transparency is pointless. So we need transparency so that we are able to hold those who need to be held accountable accountable. So one of the things that uh, Sequet said is that the media also has a way to infuse or also feed our minds with um, the negativity of the person who has been uh, shot and killed by the police. And when that occurs, uh, many times people who are watching believe everything that the media has said without getting the facts. So I want us to be all in here critical thinkers to make sure that before we come up with the saying, which is said often that that person deserved it, before we come up with that saying, we have to begin to be critical thinkers and begin to really find out what truly occurred. And oftentimes we don't do that. So today I'm encouraging you to begin to do that and not to just depend on what the media is saying. And just to add one more thing to what uh, Sequet was saying, if we look at AB 1506, which is supposed to come into law, which is actually in law, which is saying that um, in California, the district attorneys would try the case against policing. And we have always said that that is a conflict of interest because they work with the police to have the citizens arrested. And so many times they will not charge the police because maybe their children go to school with the police officer or they play golf with the police officer or whatever the case may be. And so in California, now it is um, the attorney general's responsibility to try the police cases. So if a police kills a citizen, mm. our attorney general has to look into that killing and then come up with the decision if he is going to charge the officer or not. And so I think that that is going to help um, police officers think about um, their actions before they pull the trigger. Now, I want to come back to you because your son was killed in uh, Santa Rita County Jail in California. So what could we as citizens do um, to assist uh, that kind of uh, killing taking place of another individual in county jail. What could we do? And what could we do to help you to get justice for your child? Well, furthermore, one thing is they need to stop putting these unsafe devices. That's a very unsafe device. I've looked it up. I've read upon the person who made the device, and he specifically noted 
and said out loud that there's a certain way to use it. And once you put this thing on, you need to quickly, and he said it several times, quickly put them in an upright position to make sure they can breathe. Well, in the case of my son, that's not what they did. And furthermore, this is a facility that I thought, you know, hey, all my kids is, I live in Oakland, so I'm here in Sirens. I live by the county hospital. I'm here in Sirens all day long, and I'm saying, okay, well, I know where my kids is. Two's at work, one's at school, and the one's at this county facility that I thought would have been there to take care of my child. At least, not to say take care of them, but, he would have been in better hands than been on the street. My worst nightmare was for my son to be shot out in the streets. But instead, he was in a facility. As far as holding justice, I can't even say what justice is. I need accountability. Mm. Amen. Come on. Amen. LaToya. Tell us what we can do to assist you in your quest for justice for your child. Okay. Um, so when Xavier got killed in January, um, the community was very supportive with um, raising funds for a lawyer. Um, we actually raised over like $15,000 to go to an attorney. We did free trial. We packed the courthouse and everything. For the attorney to tell me she would not take my case. And it was like money wasted. So I therefore, I went and filed my own lawsuit in April. Um, the judge granted as of Thursday of last week, I can proceed pro se um, in honor of Xavier to proceed with this court case. As far as my case is concerned, it's more so just helping me um, stay grounded. Um, when I call these moms, and I call people up at nighttime, I call for advice. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So I'm calling, I'm not a lawyer, I'm Xavier's mother. So I know how to be a mom. I could be the lawyer second, but I'm his mom first. So I just ask for support. Um, it's a, this, the legal terms are like, they're crazy to read. I keep my husband up all time of the night trying to get him to read this. I'm like, what does this mean? I don't know. But it, I think it's a matter of us to stand together collectively when I can call you guys at nighttime and say, hey, I don't know what this means, but can you help me out? Just to say, you've been through it. So what does it mean? That's, that's more, it's just this support, that's the main thing. So we hear that support is very, very important. And you see us mothers, we band together, but we also, I believe it was Tremika Mallory that wrote a book regarding uh, allies and accomplices she talked about in her book. And she's, one of the things she was saying is that not only do we need uh, people of other nationalities to march with us, right? But we need them to speak for us. Because when you speak for us, they will hear you before they hear us oftentimes. And so I'm saying that to say that we in this circle today, we in this room today can step up and not just go home, but begin to Help us to get justice for our family members. Now to the Monterosas, since you were thrown into this, where you were just living your life regularly, going day by day, working, school, and all the other things that you did, since you have been thrown, tell us how it has changed your life. It's changed our life dramatically. Um, we lost Sean during a global-wide pandemic. We were in curfew. We were on the streets protesting for George Floyd. And in Sean's case, he was out protesting. And in Vallejo, they shot him. They executed him. You know, Jared Ton was bending for his star to be bent. Um, but I think for me and Ashley, I remember our, having our former attorney. Um, and he told us, I told Ashley, we need two weeks. I need to process this. We just lost Sean. It was 48 hours of trying to us get answers, calling the coroners, no one gave us a call, you know. Again, we're from San Francisco, commuting 40 minutes away to Vallejo, California. And the, it's like Sean spoke through him to me and said, no, you have to get on camera now, you can't stop. 
And Sean always told me and Ashley, can't stop, won't stop. So, Come on, <laughs> and for me, I'm, I'm the oldest sibling, so I, I, I'm more emotional about it. And I just hear him in my ear every day telling me, it's okay, you can cry about it, but you got to do something about it. And ever since then, you know, we've, we've done everything we could. Um, the Krishna Abrams, the DA of Solano County, recused herself from Sean's case and Willie McCoy's case. Um, we petitioned to go to um, Javier Bercera when he was attorney general to look in Sean's case. And it's one of these things where we were still met with nothing. You know, as families, when you lose a loved one the way you do, you should be met with any services, um, you know, anything you need right there in hand to make sure you're okay. But then again, they see us little than nothing. They see us as second class citizens. Um, and me and my sister, we had to go protest at Governor Gavin Newsom's house with 17 other protesters. We mm -hmm. were there demanding justice for him to just hear our cries. And you can talk about what happens in other states, but you can't ignore what happens in your own backyard. Right. Um, which where we had to be, Ashley and I and 17 other protesters, we got suited and booted. <laughs> we got put in our own pods, get in a jumpsuit, and on Sean's four-month anniversary, just asking for the bare minimum of someone looking into Sean's case. And it's one of these things, who do you go to when the DA recuses themselves? Mm -hmm. When the attorney general is ignoring you, you take it to the governor. Mm -hmm. And again, we were met with silence and silence, but then we started seeing who were the next attorney generals on the list. Um, we started petitioning and rallying against getting uh, attorney general Rob Bonta to take on Sean's case. Again, with Sean's case, the, the Vallejo Police Union, um, the president of the police union was on scene the night and just started destroying evidence already. Sean already was deceased on scene, but they took him to the local hospital to call him DOA there when we know mm -hmm. executed right there by a moving vehicle. There's no way Sean was still breathing. Um, mm -hmm. So there was a lot of already the, the culture of the cover-up, you know, mm -hmm. um, destroying the, the prime, <laughs> the, the windshield of the moving vehicle where showed exactly how the officer was in a back seat. Not only did he kill my brother, but he put the other officers in the in the vehicle in danger too. The one in the passenger and the one in the driver's seat. Um, but again, it was in May of 2021 when Attorney General Rob Bonta decided to investigate Sean's case and investigate the Vallejo Police Department and their ritual of the badge bending that they have. And I say this to say, you know, whatever that outcome is, God shows us all for a bigger purpose. And I hope that with Sean's case, wherever the outcome is, that it opens the door for all of us. Because at the end of the day, you cannot just choose one case that you want. You have to choose them all and you have to intervene because in California, we have murderous departments that have rituals that they kill. The Vallejo Police Department are badge vendors. The LA Sheriff's Department have their own gangs. Mm -hmm. Alameda County too. Alameda County too. When it comes to the logistical stuff, Michelle and I handle it because my, we, on June 2nd, we made it a task and a promise that mom and dad could be on the backside and just process and grieve and mourn. That Michelle and I kind of just took that baton and ran with it and really just been, been spearheading, you know, Sean's case. And Michelle didn't mention Sean's last text message to us 40 minutes before he was murdered mm. was to send us the petition for George Floyd. And he said, can you sign this petition to get justice for George Floyd? Mm -hmm. Within a minute, Michelle said, I did it. And I sent a heart. And then just 40 minutes later, my brother was killed by Officer Jared Tan of the Vallejo Police Department. And so it's one of those things where we lose our loved ones and we just see signs or whatever. And it's just like, how? Or like, it's just divine. And not that my brother was supposed to be murdered. Obviously not. But like, there's some type of purpose we want to believe, you know? And we're, we're glad we have a praying mother who's in the background doing what we have to do um, because we got a praying mother we can never lose. And, you know, Michelle and I are doing everything we can and I don't want to take too much of your time, but, you know, what I will say is what you can do to support families. If you know families in your community, bring them a, a plate of food, yes. start a meal train, donate to the families. If, if they have an event in the communities and you're a part of that community, pull up, show up. How can you help? You know, there's a lane for everybody here. We need graphic designers. We need chefs. We need what we need. We need everything. And so if you have a gift, bring that to the movement. Bring that to these families because we need it. Families affected by police violence have no resources. In California, there's victims' compensation, but there is no victims' compensation for family affected by police violence. There's so many states that don't even include us 
to have any type of access to mental health resources, housing relocation, bereavement, nothing. We don't get none of that. And so to echo Michelle, what she was saying, we're, we're treated as nothing. And so here we are continuing to do whatever we can with bare minimum resources. And obviously we've, we've all had monumental strides and, and like stepped over milestones in, in our loved one's case, but we've done that with rice and beans. We've done that with, with very little, you know, the community's funding. We've done it with, with nothing. <laughs> Bologna sandwiches, whatever. But my point is, if you got a gift, if you're an artist, bring that art to the movement. If you, if whatever you have, bring that to us because families like us don't have no resources. So bring that. Thank you so much. And what happens oftentimes to families who lose their loved one, they're thrust out into becoming activists. So they don't even get to really go through the grieving process. They don't really get to really funeralize their loved one because they're now become an activist. And then with their activism, they also have to become detectives. They try to find out what happened. They become lawyers. I mean, so it's a host of different things that the families have to go through. And that's why it's so important to support these families, to support them in whichever way that you can. Um, um, the Monterosas gave us great examples of how we can support them. And all of these families and other families need support. And you, each one of you have the ability to support the families in one way or another. Um, I just wanted to ask another question. Um, and we're getting close to the end of our session. But I wanted to uh, start with you, uh, Gwen, if you would just tell us something uh, about your son that we may not know, something he liked to do or whatever color he loved, or just share something, a story with us about uh, Mario. You know, Mario's a beautiful spirit. And a lot of times he would, um, in our neighborhood, when I came back to the Bayview community, which is a harsh community in San Francisco, it was to take care of my terminally ill mom. Then his dad ended up um, flying the boys in, said he couldn't handle the mortgage and everything in Houston. Um, but he was always bringing, kept me connected with my community, bringing um, these beautiful kids from other families that had no mothers. And if you don't understand what happened to the black community, um, when we talk about the Reagan era, um, the crack, that was induced into that community and the guns. It just didn't get there by happenstance. It was all systemically planned. Um, and so what happens is that you end up having to be a village. You have to be an intercession that these kids that now we had this uh, fine line prison, um, pipeline to prison impacted the black communities nationwide. And then I just talking about my Bayview. Then we had this system that um, took mothers out to homes with the addictions to the crack that was induced into the black community. So now you have a just broken system with these babies having to um, be on self-survival. How do I make, protect my siblings? And so he was always bringing, hey mom, they didn't have an arm, my mother working two jobs too. But we became this village. I did wanna add, um, because it's so important, when they thought it was hush for San Francisco, and, and I bless his soul, I love this brother so very much, because he took a stance on Mario's behalf, and we thought it was Scott, but Colin Kaepernick, when he came and, see, and he said, Mario catapulted him taking that knee, ever thankful, because San Francisco thought all the dirt that they did was quiet. Let me, for the first time since Mario, the DOJ came into San Francisco and investigated on a 200 scathing review. They, and they described them as a police force that's run amok. We knew that all our lives growing up because we had a group called Starsky and Hutch. And it's the people you won't hear of. What I'm saying is Colin wrote a book, Abolishing a System. Please read it. He allowed me to put a chapter in there for Mar. Please read it because it's going to have you rethink everything we knew regarding the system. See, to some of us, they're your heroes. To a lot of us, they are, they are our terrorist threat. So for some that love their heroes, that's good. But rethink it. They're not all well. 
They come in a community and they ravish it. And it's been quiet. I want you guys to rethink when you're flying to San Francisco and you want to take in Fisherman Wharf and you want to enjoy. It's not that great for some of us. So rethink everything you knew about a system. That's all we're asking. We did because I think when you talk about a state and the policing, it is pushing a boundary. Some of us are so uncomfortable. Some of us are uncomfortable to talk about slavery with derived police derived out of that. So please rethink what you became comfortable with. They're your heroes, but they could also be somebody's terrorist. So thank you for allowing me to say that. But he was a beautiful spirit and I miss him daily. Thank you. So we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna go down the line and I want you to give a word or a sentence about your loved one, something positive. Gwen. Thank you. Yes, I wanna speak about my son, Eric. Uh, like uh, they say, the, the media put a, a narrative on, you know, they, they take it out of context. Um, just like they said, he was selling cigarettes that day, that's why he was being arrested, which is an untruth. Not saying that he didn't sell cigarettes, but he was not selling cigarettes that day. He had just broken up a fight. And that's why the police was on the scene, but they chose to target him. And my son, he loved, yes, he did sell cigarettes like to support his family, but so does so many other, all these other stores that's in the neighborhood. They sell Lucy's also, but there's nothing. They shut them down for a day and then they're back in business. So I don't think Lucy's is, should be a death sentence in which they took my son's life. And my son was a lover of football. He loved the Giants. Those diehard giants, they never won, but he loved them. <laughs> uh, his favorite color was blue and red. Uh, he loved, he, he, he just loved people. He always, like on his, on his phone booth, they have his saying, he always, when he leave, left you, he wouldn't say goodbye. He would say, share the love. Mm -hmm. That was his goodbye when he's um, leaving you. He would say, share the love. So, you know, I miss my son dearly. And I, as another mother said, I don't want to be a part of this, but I was thrown into this. I was stressed into this. So now I'm in it for the long run. <laughs> well, I want to just let you guys know a little bit about the wine. Juan was a happy person. He was the type of person that, uh, like, loved the kids, loved the kids. Mm -hmm. He didn't like the mamas or the daddy, but he loved the kids. <laughs> and I think he got that a little bit from his mama, you know what I mean? I tell my grandkids, come on, let your mama never stay at home. So, <laughs> Juan was the type of person, ever since he was like nine, ten years old, I didn't have him do it, I didn't force him to do it. He would go out and he would serve the homeless in the community. Mm -hmm. Mm. And till the day he died, before he started his little 30-day process with these jail people, he said, Mama, you know what I want to eat? And he told me what he wanted to eat. He said, well, make it for me, Mama, make it for me. So I'm making this big old, I'm putting my foot in it, y'all. Mm -hmm. And we, I drives up with it. He said, why are you taking it out the car? I said, because you were finna eat it, right? He said, no, we finna take it to the homeless over there up underneath the freeway mm -hmm. so I can serve them something to eat. Mama, they hungry. I said, okay, Dewan. So he gets over there, we take some of the food, and to make a long story short, he is not only loved and missed by his family. These people out there who he used to help, mm. they miss him. When they see me, they ask me, am I all right? They heard what happened. You know, stuff like that. It's, it's insane for these police officers to get away with what they're doing to our children. And no, I'm not, I'm gonna rephrase that. They haven't gotten away with it because they're not gonna get away with it. We're gonna sit here and we're going to fight them. We're gonna win this battle, no matter how long it takes. The battle, this is, this is real. This is a, a real walk for us families. A real walk, you know? These young men left children behind. They're, these officers not taking care of these children. Who's taking care of their children's mamas and grandmamas? 
aunties and uncles, you see what I'm saying? Where we had, you took our family member away from us that was loved. You know, you didn't have to love them, but we loved them. And we still love them. They're still here today. I feel my baby every day, and I know the rest of y'all do too. Mm -hmm. Feel them every day, because some way in some order, they're going to speak to us, mm -hmm. and they're going to let us know, yeah, y'all going to keep on this fight. Y'all going to do what y'all got to do. Don't stop, mama. Don't stop, auntie, cousin, sister, and we're not. In the name of Jesus, I love you, Dewan, and I miss you. Amen. <laughs> Shaquette. Um, my story about Stefan is this. When he was born, he was 10 pounds. I had him in five minutes. He was so strong. I had him naturally that when he came out, he ripped the placenta in half. And I had to go into surgery after I delivered him. But he was so going to go. He was ready. And when I had him, Notorious Big had just came out. So I've always given my kids their own songs. And so his song was, I love it when you call me Big Pop. If you're the true player. <laughs> that was Papa. Um, we call, my family, we call Stephon Papa. And um, I miss Papa. And, and, and he was a protector. His, he was a fighter. He was always the first one in and the last one out. He was going to make sure everybody was OK. So that was Papa. Thank you. LaToya? <laughs> OK, um, so a quick story about Xavier. Um, Y'all going to always see me in sneakers. I'm going to got on a dress. I'm going to have some kicks on. <laughs> My son absolutely love, love, love sneakers. Um, but he loves to recreate sneakers. I think that passion came from him being put on punishment. Um, when he would get in trouble in school, I was like, you know, go to your room, go upstairs. But what he did was he would take his sneakers and like, he would start painting and whatnot and paint all the shoes up to the point we had to replace the carpet in his room because he loves to do like art stuff and whatnot. So um, in closing, I just want to say for Xavier as well, people like to say, when I say my son got shot by the police, they love to say, well, what did he do? Mm -hmm. right. And I'm like, what do you mean, what did he do? No one does anything at all to be shot by the police. And I want people to know that all our kids are entitled to life, the right of life, due process by the courts, period. No one can take that from our kids. And I've been taught, because people always say, what did he do? I'm like, what do you mean? What did my son do? You cannot say to me, my son did anything, period, where he deserved to yeah. die. Come on. Period, period. So I know that in my heart, I'm here for a reason. Um, I really believe in the 14th Amendment. I believe in our rights. And granted, they, they, not all, they don't always, um, honor our rights. I know as a person, I'm Xavier's voice, so his rights will right. always be honored, period. So I just want to say that. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, one thing about Sean, um, he was a middle sibling. We're all two, two, two years apart, but we felt like more like triplets, just the way we lived in tight corners. So mom was like, y'all got to get along with each other no matter what. Um, but one thing about Sean, him being the middle sibling, he took trying to be the older brother really serious. Um, he really, like, he was like, I'm the next man in the house, you know. Um, I got to do this. Um, so with him, I remember when he had his 1980 El Camino, <laughs> his little project car, I would just th sit there and be like, why are you taking the battery out and bringing it home? He said, sis, we live in Bib City. Somebody go take, our we'll take my car. <laughs> so for me, it was just really funny to see him take the battery out and bring it home. But, um, you know, I, I truly miss him. But then again, I, I pay attention to the signs. And I purposely say a, a 1980 El Camino. It's a very rare car, but any state or anywhere we are, I was just in Seattle last weekend, and I saw one around the corner. So I know he's with me. And if it's not a 1980 El Camino, it's a toucan, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to have to, we got we to... Gotta, um... I got two minutes. So I want to first say that for Oscar, Oscar was a born leader. In that leading, when he was on the platform and he, they were detained by the police, he told the police, or he told his friends, you guys follow what they say, we're going home. Oscar didn't make it home, but his friends did. And so I want to say you have heard each one of us share our story 
And I want to encourage each one of you to not leave this place the same, but to be propelled and compelled to go out there and to fight with us to change liberty. Because we understand that our liberty is in balance and we want to balance liberty and if that means we have to go back and change our system of policing then we take it and we build one brick at a time to rebuild the system to change it from the 19 and 1800s the way it was set up and so um, I believe we're going to take questions from the audience and then we're going to close Any questions from the audience? I got a question. Um, I wanted to ask each uh, mother and sister, what is something that you miss most uh, about your loved one? Uh, something they would say just in casual conversation. Something you think about, like on a, on a regular. Un dicho o algo que la hacía que extrañas lo más. Lo que más extraño de John era ver cómo compartía con la gente. Yo amo cocinar y siempre decía, mucho mami, mucho, porque siempre hay un plato para llevarle a alguien. Era, no quería que los niños en la calle tengan hambre. Y siempre me decía, cuando yo tenga mucho mami voy a abrir un lugar para que a esos niños no les falte la comida. Y extraño eso porque es algo que quedó dentro de mí que lo íbamos a hacer junto, porque siempre le enseñé, cuando tienes dos, da uno. Nunca te olvides, hijo, de tu prójimo. Ama a tu prójimo como a ti mismo. Si te amas tú, comparte con el desválido, el necesitado. She said what she misses most is how giving Sean was and how she would always tell, he would always tell my mom, like, cook a lot of food because I got food, I need to give food to people because people are hungry. Um, and so for her, she always taught Sean certain values. Like, if you have two, you always give the one to the next person. You have to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And so that's something she really misses. Um, I think for me, I just miss my sons asking me if dinner is ready or what I cooked. Um, just, that's the main thing. That boy loved to eat. And to be just us three in the household, they could eat a pack of, mac a pack of uh, macaroni and cheese by himself. So I just miss him asking me what I cook for him. Um, for me, Stefan, um, he was a scholar. So he, he uh, what I miss most are our conversations. Um, but the way that he would, uh, when he would be confronted or challenged, his response to everything was, don't matter. <laughs> you can say whatever to him and if he didn't agree, don't matter. <laughs> don't matter. And I have embraced that, like, you know, it don't matter. Some some, some stuff don't matter. He you know, so um that and then the second thing that he would always say is um never say goodbye, say see you later. Mm -hmm. One thing I miss about the wine is the slamming the doors. Oh my gosh. <laughs> He'll slam the door. Hey mama, you cook? <laughs> mama, I'm hungry. What's up, girl? You know, another thing I hated was just like he always said, Oh my mama. I said, oh, Don't girl. say. I said, Don't put nothing right. on me, boy. Right. You know, and he thought that was right. funny, but he always said right. it. <laughs> I miss him. Um, what I miss most about Eric, first of all, I miss his smile because he had a smile that would light up the room and he was a jokester. Um, he could think on his feet. Anything you say, he could come back at you. And everybody used to wait for him to come to the party. You know, if we had a family gathering, they say the party don't start till Eric gets here. So <laughs> I used to love that about him. And his saying, you know, you could start saying, Eric, I want you to do so and so. He would always say, no doubt. No doubt he's going to agree with you if he's going to do it or not. No doubt I'm going to do it. You know, so I really, really miss my son. <laughs> I think with Mar, I, I remember when it, it happened to him, and um, we always, as black mothers, that we have to run out the gate without grieving. But I remember thinking, he's never gonna say mom. He's always mom, mom, mom. Where are we going? Where are we going? Mom, mom. And like, who's gonna say that now? Um, and for sure, 
and psych. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was heartbreaking. And still, I, I hear them in my head, mom, mom, pull together, mom. That mom, who's going to say that mom like that? Yeah. So for me, when I think about Oscar and I think about his personality, I think about how Oscar would always want to be the leader, and he was the youngest. Um, he always would say, Mom, I got this. Mom, I got this. I'm the man of the house. Mom, I got this. And um, he would always be a jokester. So he loved to joke and he loved to laugh. And one of the last things is he was a very, very caring young man. If you needed it and he had it, you got it. And That's so right. um, I want to close with this. I, um, do, I think we might have time for one more question. Um, What I miss most, well, for me, I was a baby sister, and, and me, like, growing up in a first-gen Latino family, my parents worked seven days a week, so I didn't really have, I had my dad, but I didn't have the father figure, and so my brother was, like, my father figure, so I am who I am, because I'm my brother. I'm Toucan Jr., so, like, you can't fuck with me, because I'm, I'm Sean's sister, and so, you know, I think I miss him being that father figure for me. Any other questions? Depends on like like if I'm by myself, I know I can cry and scream in the room by myself or whatnot. Um, my husband is there. I might be able to you know maybe cuss him out a little bit here and there. I don't mean it's towards him, but I think it it depends on like where you're at at that moment, you know, and what it comes to. Uh, um, my son did see me a lot for the butterfly form. Um, I noticed that I live on the fifth floor, so butterflies should not be upstairs on the fifth floor like ever. They're always up there on the fifth floor and whatnot. So I think they visit us in a certain. I, and I agree with that. I think that it depends on where we're at emotionally. And there are times when I, I, I'll get a visit from Oscar and I'll start laughing because of something funny that he did or something funny that he had said. And um, there's other times where Oscar used to always turn out my light. I would say, turn on my light, Oscar. And I would start uh, crying because he's not there to turn out, you know, my light anymore. So I think it just depends on where you're at in the grieving process. Because we all grieve differently. One day we might feel that anger. One day we might feel depressed. One day we might be happy. Uh, so it's like, um, one lady said that it's like a roller coaster. That's how grief is. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down, and sometimes you're in the middle. But wherever you are in that spectrum, we always say you can go through the grieving process as long as you don't hurt hurt yourself or hurt anyone else around you because we understand it from this line that PTSD is real. We, we only talked about it for military people, but we have to talk about it in terms of today because so many people see the different things that have been occurring in our communities and because of that they suffer from PTSD and so with that said we say that it's important to get the help that you need the treatment that you need whether it be to a, go see a psychiatrist a psychologist whether it be to go see your pastor or your priest it's important to get the treatment that you need so that you could be effective in this society and once again I ask all of these 
uh, ladies up here, families have uh, foundations, and you can help their foundation. You can help each of them by seeing where they need you to help at and supporting them, not just today, but ongoing. And again, we thank you. I thank the panelists for their answers and for their time today. May God continue to bless each and every one of you.